It's Tuesday, June 7th. From inside the WTOP newsroom, this is the DMV Download, presented by Steamfitters Local 602. Learn how Steamfitters can benefit your business at steamfitters-602.org. Today, we're talking exclusively with D.C. Police Chief Robert Conti about the topic on everyone's minds, mass violence, how they prepare for it, what they've learned from the recent sniper shooting in Van Ness, and the school shooting in Uvalde, Texas. Now officers uh, here in D.C., uh, if there is an active shooter, if there are active homicides happening in the building, we're going in the building, period. And Chief Conti also speaks to the rise in teen violence and carjackings. We discuss how teen crime has become more confrontational and how the district's criminal justice system needs to respond. If we want to see something different, then we may have to do something different. Thanks for joining us. I'm Megan Cloherty. And I'm Luke Garrett. Public safety is top of mind in D.C. Violent crime persistently increased in the nation's capital over the last few years, and police departments are hemorrhaging officers and competing for new recruits. All the while nationally, there are serious conversations playing out about how to guard against mass violence. Metropolitan Police Department Chief Robert Conti joins us now in the studio to talk about all of this. Chief, thanks for being here to start with. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, let's start with the concern we all have, uh, mass shootings and, you know, the fact that we're still talking about this so many years later. But, of course, it's on the top of everyone's mind since the shooting at Robb Elementary in Uvalde, followed by multiple mass shootings in Phoenix and Philadelphia, to name a few. Uh, just this morning, there's a new bulletin from the Department of Homeland Security warning about how online forums are encouraging copycat Uvalde attacks. I wanted to ask you, when it comes to our city and our schools, have you had the chance to sit down with DCPS, kind of look at the plan? Do you kind of change depending on the latest event and change your response a little? Well, first of all, I would be remiss if I didn't say it. It is the thing that keeps me up at night when you talk about mass shootings. Uh, it can happen anywhere, uh, anytime, in, in any city. And quite frankly, when you see the increased numbers of automatic firearms that are in communities uh, right now here in the District of Columbia so far this year, uh, we recovered 55 automatic, uh, fully automatic firearms. All of last year, we, we recovered 66 fully automatic firearms. And wow. we still have six months left in the year. So it is the thing that keeps me uh, up at night. But with respect to the schools uh, specifically, uh, we'll be doing a tabletop exercise with the schools uh, very soon uh, with all of our, our schools to really talk about the things that we do here in the District of Columbia as a police agency in terms of how we respond to these mm -hmm. situations. Now, officers uh, here in D.C., uh, if there is an active shooter, if there are active homicides happening in the building, we're going in the building, period. Mm. That's what I was going to ask you, because the whole thing about the Uvalde situation with so many different uh, agencies responding in that hour long time mm -hmm. period it, I'm not saying it would happen in D.C., but there's so many agencies here. Right. Sometimes there's a jurisdictional question. I mean, is that something that, that you've planned for? Well, that happened at, on the Van Ness uh, Street uh, shooting. We had FBI, ATF, MPD, uh, Secret Service. We had all those entities on the scene. But uh, we are fortunate in the sense that in this region, uh, there's a lot of collaboration that happens between MPD and our federal partners, and we work very well together. Yeah, you know and each I, other. Yeah, yeah, and I think the, the Van Ness shooting is, is an example of that collaboration really coming together. Right, and speaking of the Van Ness shooting, you know, at the last press conference you gave to the public, there was still some information that we were waiting on, on financial records and such. So is there any more information we know about Raymond Spencer, specifically, you know, why he did what he did? Yeah, so we don't have anything additional at this point that, uh, that really uh, nails it down. Uh, we know that he was in, in financial debt as a result of some of the purchases he was making on the credit cards that he had. I mean, we know that. And some of these shootings sometimes is, you know, experienced by some of the, the uh, previous ones that we've seen or recent ones that we've seen. Uh, you know, there's a manifesto. There's a note. Mm -hmm. There's something. Mm. We don't have that yet in this case. And, you know, as we continue to exploit his uh, electronic devices, I'm hoping that we'll be able to find out a reason why. And how do you think about these occurrences where shooters are using 4chan, publishing videos, these manifestos? You've been in the police business for 31 years. You know, is this something new? And how have police departments been facing this new challenge? So technology has evolved. And as technology uh, evolves, crime evolves. And the way that people commit crimes, it evolves. You go back to, you know, 20, 30 years ago when we really started to see an uptick in semi-automatic handguns being used in communities. Now we're at a point where we're seeing 
automatic uh, firearms and, and p- uh, personally made firearms being used, um, you know, in communities. So things have evolved over the course of, of years. And as we chart out our, our, and strategize in the law enforcement community, it's having conversations with other chiefs of police, major chiefs of uh, police from all around the country on these very important topics to really just, you know, assess where the best practices are. We have to make sure that we evolve with the times and the changes that we see. Pulling back for a minute, because I know I've been, you and I have both been here a while. (laughs) We've been covering uh, (laughs) violence in the city for a while. And it seems like what really pulls at your heartstrings is when we tell these victim stories. We tell these kids stories. We tell that, you know, yeah, we're talking about Raymond Spencer, Mm -hmm. but I want to be talking about the people, the four people who were hurt that day, right? Yeah. It just, to me, it seems like, you know, we have four people's lives who are forever changed because of that one incident that we've all moved on from. Does each incident then inform your training? Does it change how you guys train for something like a mass shooting? I mean, do you even train for a mass shooting? I don't know how you train for that, but. So we do. We do train. And I, I will I will say this, you know, I have not moved on uh, from it. I know a lot of people in community oftentimes just kind of move on to the next thing. Uh, but, you know, I oftentimes will say people respond differently depending on their proximity to the pain. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. One of the people who was shot in that was a former Metropolitan Police officer that I know personally uh, commanded. I was his commander at the 2nd District. I went to visit him in the hospital. And, uh, you know, it's very troubling. His life has been changed forever as a result of this. And I'm sure uh, a lot of the people that are involved, one of my neighbors, his daughter, is a teacher at Edmund Burke. And he, I was out walking my dog the other night, and he, he, he said, I want to thank you uh, for the way you guys responded to that situation. Uh, my daughter was in there. She's wow. a, a teacher at the school. So, you know, I, I certainly haven't moved on for it, but it certainly uh, informs the way that we train. When you think about Raymond Spencer and the situation at Van Ness, the way that he committed the acts that he committed was very much, it very much resembled the shooter from Las Vegas in terms of the things that he did. If you look at the the guy who did the shooting in in Buffalo, Mm. uh, he very much uh, copied uh, what happened. I believe it was in New Zealand or somewhere. Mm. He very much copied that shooting. I mean, so like lining up the guns to be ready, like all the things that he set up and all all those things, all of those things. So, you know, when you're training and you're and you're and you are preparing your force for it, be it your special operations, your SWAT guys or your patrol guys, there are things that we have to think about in terms of how we do business, how Mm -hmm. we prepare to address the situations that we that we know of. And even some of those that, you know, have not happened uh, yet, but we plan for. So, you know, you have to always be in a space of continual uh, improvement. Mm-hmm. You know, again, like technology is evolving, so does your tactics and your mm-hmm. training. They have to evolve over time because people are, are are watching really what's happening literally across the world. And we have to be prepared for that. I mean, not to harp on this one incident, but it speaks to why you didn't know where the shots were coming from or we didn't know where the shots were coming from. Mm-hmm. And then we find out that you had the snipers up on the roof. So you're Really, I mean, you didn't know where he he was, but you were ready for that possibility. Yeah, so, I mean, you have to do all those things, right? You're talking about something that comes out of tactics and training. So where this guy is shooting, he's shooting from an elevated position. What if all of the first responders, to include the medical folks, just went to the location where he was shooting Mm. to retrieve injured to, you know, because we don't know at that point where this shooting is coming from. He would have had, uh, you know, just a target-rich environment of first responders, mm. right? I mean, we've seen something similar to that when we think back to the police officers in Dallas. Yeah. You know, they got shot. So, I mean, again, th- when I say the situation could have been a lot worse, it, it really could have been. But again, as part of your training, all right, if you don't know where the shooting is coming from, or in this case, you do know where it is, it could be a trap. And it could be an opportunity for the shooter to lure first responders into that area. So from your training perspective, you know, perimeters have to be set up. And then when you're dealing with the school, again, talking about the balance, all right, if we don't know exactly where the shooter is, when is it appropriate for you to go into the school and deal with whatever situation might be unfolding in the school? Without creating more targets. Without creating more targets, et cetera. Mm. And then decisions to, you know, when do you evacuate? If you don't know where the shooter is, when, at what point is it safe to evacuate the children out of the building? Right. You know what I mean? So it's so many different dynamics and so many different decisions that are being made in, a, in, in very rapid succession, to be quite honest with you. You know, life or death situations. In one of the instances uh, for the Van Ness Street shooting, a decision was made to carry the wounded 
um, or at least some of the wounded, to carry them to away. To your friend. Yes, yeah. to carry him away from that side. I mean, that was a life or death mm. situation. And I'm sure, you know, it, uh, I'm thankful that he's still still with us. But, you know, had he not uh, made it through, I'm sure that that's something that, you know, we would have to look at to see, well, mm. you know, as a result of this trying to save a life, did we, did we, you know, hinder perhaps, you know, him receiving medical treatment? So yeah. there's a lot of things that are happening in that space. And we have to talk to our members uh, you know, it's one of the things that concerns me, especially right now, you know, with this national debate about school resource officers mm-hmm. in schools or not in schools. You know, one of the things about the Van Ness shooting uh, that happened there, there was an off-duty officer working as a school officer at Edmund Burke School who was out there, who was one of the targets that was shot at. And our response, our response capacity in terms of the notification to the other law enforcement officers to get on the scene it happened rapidly in part because he was there on the scene. So as we talk about these things mm-hmm. right now, as we have in this, these discussions, right, you know, Montgomery County, as an example, you know, they had unfortunately had the shooting inside of Magruder High School. And as a result of that, their posture changed. And they, OK, well, we need mm-hmm. to kind of rethink this whole thing about school resource officers and the yeah. school and so forth. So there's so many things that are tied to these incidents. And I think that we always have to be thinking Forward, we always have to be thinking, not in a, from a reactive standpoint. You know, wait until something happened, and then what do we mm-hmm. do? If that thing were to happen today, what would we do? Mm-hmm. And is it something that we do different than what we're doing right now? Mm. So instead of reactionary, preventative, yes. doing preventative work. Yeah. And what's in the work as far as preventative work? I mean, would you characterize school resource officers as preventative work? I think school resource officers are, are deterrent. Uh, when you have uh, an absolute and clearly in this case we talked about with Van Ness, I mean, there was an officer that was out there who was in uniform and that did not deter this guy uh, from doing what he did. You had a motivated individual who did what he did and nothing deterred him from that. But how do you measure? How do you measure the things that don't happen because of the presence of officers uh, at schools? Mm-hmm. Uh, and what we know for certain, what I know for certain, right, being one back in 2004 mm-hmm. who stood over top of a young man who was shot and killed inside of Baloo High School, right, that really started the, uh, that created the law that mandated our police officers to be in D.C. Mm-hmm. public schools. I stood over top of that kid. Mm. And, you know, I think there's a there's a saying, right, if, if we don't remember our past, we'll condemn to repeat it. And, th- th- again, those are things that, that keep me up at night because I think that we have forgotten uh, our past and our effort to kind of change the way that we do business and want to do something different. We have to remember, you know, why we have these officers present Uh, in the first place, Mm. to be a deterrent. There are certainly things that happen uh, in schools sometimes that bleed over into communities and vice versa, things that happen in communities that bleed over into the schools. And I'm not saying that that's the case at every school all the time, but uh, we certainly have instance after instance around the country that we can point to where these things have happened. Case in point, very recently, uh, I was with the uh, superintendent in New Orleans a couple of days ago. Uh, There was a shooting in New Orleans that happened at a high school graduation where an 80-year-old grandmother was shot and killed as a result of a dispute between young people. So, you know, the, the threat there is real. And how we, again, you know, we can always Monday morning quarterback these things, but I think that proactively there's some things that we have to think about. And after the break, we continue our conversation with Chief Conti about rising teen crime and the prevalence of carjackings in the region. He tells us why he's worried for the carjackers themselves. If you want to save money and grow profits on your next commercial heating, cooling, HVAC, or refrigeration project, go with the men and women of Steamfitters Local 602. You can trust the experience of its workforce, members who have expertise in heating, air conditioning, refrigeration, and process piping to deliver work that's on time and on budget. For a partner you can trust who's mutually focused on your bottom line and to schedule, contact Steamfitters Local 602 at steamfitters-602.org. That's steamfitters-602.org. Steamfitters Local 602, changing lives. Thanks for listening to the DMV Download. If you like the podcast, head to our show page, give us a rating, and leave a review. We read all of them and use the suggestions to improve this show that we're so proud of. It also helps other listeners find this, our region's only local daily news podcast. Thanks for making us a part of your day. We return now to our conversation with D.C. Police Chief Robert Conti. 
Do you think there's a, a feeling in the city now toward teenagers that there didn't used to be? And I, I don't mean to be flippant about it, but we've had a, lo- a surge in teen violence. Uh, we've had this carjacking issue that is predominantly, um, you know, sort of a teen crime, right? Mm-hmm. We mentioned that Fairfax County Police Chief Kevin Davis was here with us a few weeks ago, and he said that's the number one c- crime he's concerned about because he said these kids are young, yes, they don't know what they're doing, and they're armed. To say, are you concerned about teen violence? It seems like a, a softball question, but mm-hmm. what can we do about this now that it's summer, kids are out of school? I mean, are you concerned this is going to go even more crazy than it already is. So I'm always concerned uh, about that. And it is the thing that concerns me with these young people because uh, we are seeing young people engaged in violent crimes a lot sooner. Um, If the violent crime is the entry point into the criminal justice system, you know, in the past, it might be, you know, they stole a car or they broke into a car or they stole something from somewhere. And now the entry crime is like, a gun in somebody's face and taking their car. It's a confrontational, right? yeah. yeah. So that, that's that's a different. That is a shift from what we've seen in the past. Huh. And I think I, I think it's important. Chief Davis mentioned it when you interviewed him. But beyond just the D.C. region, it's happening in Chicago and right. other major cities. We have to look at this uh, from the national lens through the, through that lens because it is the thing that is happening across our country. So if D.C. was an outlier or Fairfax County was an outlier, that would be one thing. Right. But this is th- these are things that are happening all across our country involving our young people. And it started really at the height of the pandemic when mm. young people got disconnected from services, mm. when young people, when the just, the, I, I just get the sense, and this is just me, people are at a different place right now. Uh, tension is is just, is high and and people, the tolerance that people have, you know, for one, for one another, I mean, it, you know, anything, I mean, just, it, it, mm. it throws people just off the rails and at a level right now that I have not, I have not seen in a very long time in and the city. it plays to the mental health of these kids too. Yes. I mean, we've, se- we've talked about that um, on WTOP extensively, mm-hmm. but what they've been through and how they can handle it with their, you know, maturing brains and the, the fact that their social life, I mean, everything changed for them. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, that has to contribute to it. And I know um, you have spoken about how successful y'all have been in trying to track down a lot of these kids are repeat offenders. So they if you are. get one, then you pull, you know, possibly the last five or six carjackings that have happened. And, and it's all attributed to one uh, teenager. Do you find that you are getting the majority of these kids and, and trying to, you know, pull them out of this crime trend? Or is it something that, like you said, it's continuing, continuing, continuing? It's continuing. Um, I, I think that there has been some progress uh, as we get back to some sense of normalcy. Mm. But to your point. We are experiencing young people uh, who have been involved in multiple uh, carjackings. And when those young people, if the, I don't want to say punishment because it's not punishment, but the response from whether it's from the courts or whatever is that this young person who did this, uh, we're going to put him in a group home in community because we think that that's better for him. Uh, I I don't know. I think we might, as we talk about evolving times, I think those are things that we have to look at. Like, is that really the best place for him? Are are we really going to see this young person, you know, not continuing to be involved in criminal activity? My fear is not just those kinds of things that they do, but if they try to carjack the wrong person, right? Uh, We have a lot of people in our city who now have concealed carry permits in our city. Mm -hmm. What if they try to carjack the wrong person and that young person, you know, loses their life? I I can tell you, you know, just from the homicides that we deal with right now in our city, the number of people who are homicide victims and, you know, have firearms on them, that's not every case, but there is a significant number of people that fall into that category. So with our young people who are armed and they're out here committing some of these crimes, I worry about them. Uh, in that mm. space, you know, and just kind of, I mean, like lives are changed as a result of some of these decisions that they make. And I think as a ecosystem, as a city, uh, we have a res- as a community, as a whole, we have a responsibility to our young people. We really do. Right. I was one of these young kids growing up in this city, you know, running around. Thank God I was not out, you know, doing anything crazy on that level of carjacking anybody. But yeah. I was a young kid growing up in this city. And I know that, you know, when you are connected to your friends and peer pressure and all that kind of stuff, there are opportunities for you to get into trouble here in the city. So I'm not suggesting 
anything that would hinder our young people from being productive adults in life and, you know, locking them up, throwing away the key. I'm not suggesting that at all. What I am talking about, however, is the things that we can do to make communities safer and Mm -hmm. what does that look like. And I believe that with all the creative juice that we have in this city, uh, the residents who live in this city, I believe that we can come up with something better than what we're doing for our young people right now. That leads me to a question that I've been dying to ask you about sentencing Mm -hmm. guidelines when it comes to gun crimes. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Well, I mean, we talk about, you know— and this is coming from from a, a crime reporter yeah. who has seen this for years and years and years. So I'm not trying to get personal about it. Mm-hmm. But you have somebody who who commits a, a violent crime and then you look back at their record and they may have three or four or five gun crimes before that. And I know your predecessor was frustrated about this. I, I don't want to I mean, I want to ask you how you feel. Do you think this is part of the evolving, you know, do you think this is part of how we evolve our justice system is we look at things that are affecting especially young people? Mm-hmm gun crimes in the city absolutely and 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 reevaluate what the consequences are and what the gun you know sentencing guidelines should be oh I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that and I'm 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 not saying anything to you that I haven't said publicly before so we're not right? breaking news so is what we're right so <laughs> so so if it if it offends somebody along the way you know charge it to my head not my heart but it's it's really what I believe and I believe that when you think about our ecosystem, the whole criminal justice ecosystem, it may be time for us to reevaluate those things. As you mentioned, the sentencing guidelines and so forth. If the thing that we're doing is not changing behavior, then why do we continue to do it? And if we, if we, if we want to see something different, then we may have to do something different. And doing something different, what does that look like? Right. It goes back to what I said before. People respond differently depending on their proximity to the pain. So if you're the person who has the gun put in your face, three weeks ago, you might have felt like, hey, look, you know, we're going to give people three and four chances and blah, blah, blah. But when the gun gets put in your face this week, you feel a little different now about that. Maybe those chances are not three or four chances, but maybe this person needs, you know, they need some really concentrated services in an environment that is going to be able to help them over the course of time so that when they're ready to rejoin community, we don't have to worry about them putting a gun in somebody's face two weeks from now. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I think that we really have to we really have to reexamine this space. Uh, I am a, a strong advocate for this space, and, and some people may not agree with me, and that's fine, but I'm the guy. I'm the guy responsible when we're going out here and we go out into communities and I have older people, younger people, uh, people who are working people with guns put in their face. And I look at the number of firearms, illegal firearms that we have recovered in this city so far this year, over 1,300 illegal firearms, 500 over where we were same time last year. That says to me the consequence that we currently have in place is not doing enough to deter behavior. Mm. It's not. It's not doing enough to change behavior from what people have been doing because if there was a consequence associated with it that changed behavior, then people might think twice about whether or not, not just carrying a gun, Mm -hmm. but carrying a gun and using it, right? Some people will try to use this narrative, oh, you know, well, some people carry a gun because they don't feel safe and all this stuff, And and I get that. But the reality is we see petty disputes in our city that result in a homicide because somebody introduced a gun into the scenario. Mm. So as you can tell, there is a lot here and Chief Conti has a lot more to say. And in the second part of our interview, which will air tomorrow, you know, we really dive into what Chief Conti thinks about how DC's criminal justice ecosystem needs to change and all the players that are involved in that. We also talk about the perception of more violence on Metro, Metro bus and Metro rail. And the idea that, you know, the police department is struggling, just like all police departments are, with recruiting and staffing. But how Conti says his plan to get more officers is not to lower its standards. There's a lot to unpack, so take a listen tomorrow. That'll do it for us now. Thanks for joining us for the DMV Download, sponsored by Steamfitters Local 602. Our managing editor is Craig Schwab, and our music is by Real World. Give us a review and rate our show if you get the chance. And follow us on social media, where we post content every day from behind the scenes. You can find out more about this podcast and become one of our VIP listeners at dmvdownload.com. The DMV Download is a product of WTOP News. Listen on 103.5 FM in D.C., 107.7 FM in Virginia, 103.9 FM in Frederick, online at wtop.com and on the WTOP News app.
Have a great night.